Welcome. I am your host for today's training module, Tia Boyd. This is the final module of this training about MPOs and congestion reduction. In previous modules, we discussed the basic role MPOs play in their metropolitan areas, making transportation planning and programming decisions. We also learned about types of congestion, their causes, and various congestion reduction strategies that can be employed to improve system conditions based on the identified causes of congestion. Today, we are going to consider what MPOs can do to reduce congestion and your role as an MPO board member. I'll be joined by Jeff Kramer and Taylor Deinhardt from the Center for Urban Transportation Research at the University of South Florida. Thanks for having us. Uh, happy to be here. As always, I'd like to thank the National Institute for Congestion Reduction for providing funding for this training and our partners, the Association of Metropolitan Planning Organizations, Florida Metropolitan Planning Organization Advisory Council, and National Association of Regional Councils for their guidance as members of the Project Advisory Committee. We couldn't have made this training available to you without their help and support. So, Jeff, what can an MPO do to reduce congestion in its metropolitan area? After all, other agencies actually own and maintain roads and bridges, like states and local governments, or an expressway authority. Other agencies provide transportation services, like the local transit operator, the airport or seaport, or rail authority. If the MPO doesn't own or operate transportation facilities or services, what can it do? You're right. Other agencies are the owner or the operator of the transportation system, but there's still a lot that an MPO can do because the other agencies depend on the MPO board and the MPO in general for a few key reasons. First, the MPO establishes the transportation vision for the future. And that vision influences transportation decisions for the entire metropolitan area. As you might recall from a previous module, the MPO does this as part of the Metropolitan Transportation Plan, or MTP. Some of you in other parts of the country might call this a long range transportation plan or the MPO plan, but in federal law, it's the Metropolitan Transportation Plan or MTP. That's what I'm going to call it in this session. Second, MPOs provide the forum for education and discussion on the wide variety of transportation related issues their communities face. This includes bringing other agencies before the board to discuss their ongoing projects and activities, receiving briefings from MPO staff about ongoing studies and data collection activities, hearing from members of MPO committees about issues of concern to them, and having discussions between board members on pressing transportation issues in their home communities and the broader region. MPOs also maintain an active public engagement process to both inform the public and stakeholders about MPO activities and to gather input and opinion. And third, MPOs make important planning and programming decisions, including adopting the MTP and the Transportation Improvement Program or TIP. An MPO must prepare these documents to make federal transportation funds available for the projects and services they want to implement in their metropolitan area. It's the key to the MPO's authority and MPO board members as the final decision makers, they hold the key. Collectively, board members vote to approve the Metropolitan Transportation Plan, the Transportation Improvement Program, and a variety of other documents that identify projects to be funded. But if an individual MPO board member has not actively participated in the development of those documents, if they just let staff and other participants in the process and other board members take on that role, then their influence is limited just to that final vote of approval. An effective MPO board member educates themselves before that final vote on the issues of concern in the area, including issues related to congestion and provides input and guidance as plans and programs are being developed. That way, when it comes time for the final vote, they've had a more significant voice in the decision-making process. 
So MPO board members vote to approve plans and programs that direct federal funding and individual board members have more influence the more involved they are in the development of those plans and programs. Did I get that right? Yes, you did. But, and I spell this with a capital B-U-T, that's just a portion of what board members can do. The most effective MPO board members fill a wide range of roles for their MPOs. Board members have a role as a manager, helping ensure the smooth progress of projects through the pipeline in that MPO staff are provided with the resources needed to complete their function. Board members can be visionaries, helping other board members and their own communities to see beyond jurisdictional lines to achieve regional goals together and to establish the transportation vision of the future. When conflicts arise, either between members or between agencies, individual MPO board members can be the mediator who reconciles conflicts between the parties, particularly if they are from a part of the metropolitan area not directly impacted by the issue at hand. Individual board members can also take on the role of negotiator. Working with partners through the ongoing 3C process to help establish and secure the fulfillment of the MPO's vision for the future of the region. Board members can be innovators. The transportation decision making process is pretty regulated and full of rules, but there is room for innovation and MPO board members are perfectly placed to introduce new ideas, new thoughts and new ways for communities to work. Effective MPO board members are also educators. The transportation planning process is complex and confusing to those who aren't familiar with it. To be honest, it can be confusing for those of us who are. You can inform and educate the public on this process, helping them both to understand it better and to engage with it more productively. MPO board members are advocates. To be effective, a member needs to be an advocate. That can be for a particular project or for the process itself, or for certain stakeholders in the MPO process. It's up to individual members to decide how to make the best use of that platform. And an MPO board member should be a good teammate. MPO staff are incredibly knowledgeable and are positioned to provide a great deal of support to the board. Being a good teammate here means recognizing that staff members are subject matter experts in their field. Building trust and lines of communication with the MPO staff and working towards coordination and partnership with MPO staff. Okay, this is great. It sounds like what I'm hearing is that board members have a circle of control, meaning things they have direct control over that is fairly narrow, focus primarily on approving transportation plans and programs for the region, like the MTP, the TIP, and the Unified Planning Work Program, or UPWP, the document that acts as the agency budget. But their circle of influence is quite broad and is where the meat and potatoes of this position really lies. Yep, that's it in a nutshell. So in terms of congestion reduction, how does this look in practice? How can MPOs help to reduce congestion in their metropolitan areas? Well, first and probably foremost, the MPO sets the vision for the future of transportation in their region. This is in the MTP, or as I mentioned before, or whatever you call it locally. This vision, supported by a series of goals and objectives, established in the MTP should take into account available resources and the aspirations of a wide range of stakeholders and paint a clear picture of what the MPO board wants the region to look like when it grows up. All decisions made by the MPO should be in fulfillment of the MTP vision and other agencies should and do use that vision as a guide for their plans, programs, and projects. This is a big deal. If you want to reduce congestion, this is where you start, including congestion reduction in the MTP, MTP vision, goals, and objectives. Yeah, actually, a good example of this is from the North Central Texas COG, the MPO for the Dallas-Fort Worth metropolitan area. They have four overarching goals which define the purpose of the MTP, which they name Mobility 2045. 
Under the first goal, mobility, they explicitly write that one big picture item that they want their MTP to focus on is travel efficiency measures and system enhancement targeted at congestion reduction and management. In other words, the MPO board wanted the mix of projects and activities in the MTP to improve the movement of people and goods through management strategies that reduce congestion. Strategies like we discussed in the last module of this training that focused on improved management of the existing system, altering traveler behavior, providing modal alternatives to driving alone, and making capacity improvements were absolutely necessary. The New York Metropolitan Transportation Council also makes it immediately clear in their MTP that congestion reduction is a priority. While they don't use the exact words congestion reduction, the wording they do use sets the stage for programs and plans that do just that, ensure reliable, accessible, efficient, and seamless travel that takes into account growing demand on their transportation infrastructure. Okay, got it. Set a vision or mission in the MTP that addresses a commitment to congestion reduction. Exactly. The vast majority were conducted by the MPO, both planning activities and non-planning activities supports the development and impl implementation of the MTP in some way. And most activities are looking to contribute to the fulfillment of that vision. Okay, now let's talk about planning. I mentioned several times now that under their planning obligations, MPOs develop the regional MTP and a variety of other planning studies. In larger metropolitan areas, they are mandated to also manage a congestion management process, or CMP, lots of acronyms in this business. And many smaller MPOs choose to maintain a CMP by choice. Ultimately, the MTP is the most prominent planning document produced by the MPO. Projects and activities receiving federal surface transportation funding in the metropolitan planning area must be identified directly or by reference in the MTP. These include the wide range of projects and strategies we discussed in previous modules that are specifically designed to reduce congestion, including transportation system management and operations, or TISMO projects, transportation demand management, or TDM projects, and projects that expand modal choices in the region, projects that impact behavior related to freight and passenger movements, and capacity projects where they make sense. And since the MTP is a long range planning document looking at least 20 years into the future, even projects and strategies that aren't expected to be implemented any time in the near future must be included for funding in the MTP. Basically, the MTP is the key to making sure that funding, especially federal funding, is directed to congestion reduction projects and strategies in the metropolitan area, even ones that won't be implemented for several years. Tell me a little more about funding, because this seems like a crucial piece of the whole operation. For starters, how do MPOs decide what they will fund in their MTP? That's a great question. You know, funds are always limited. There are always more projects than there is money to pay for them. So each MPO has their own method for deciding how they are going to allocate their limited resources. Many MPOs use a weighted scoring strategy for project selection. Congestion reduction might be one of the criteria used in that scoring system. Depending on the weight congestion reduction is given, it would have more or less influence on the projects and strategies being included in the MTP. Right. One MPO that uses this technique is the Pikes Peak Area COG. For their most recent MTP, they created goals, performance measures, and regional targets. Then they developed evaluation criteria for project selection. To do this, member jurisdictions of the MPO considered each of the regional goal and objective areas to ensure the criteria would evaluate projects based on all regional priorities. The MPO hosted technical advisory committee workshops to develop scoring criteria for project selection. Ultimately, the committee and MPO staff recommended 12 scoring criteria, which captured the most significant and measurable components of their regional targets. Looking at two of their goals that address congestion and efficiency of their roads, we can see three of the 12 criteria here. Process of prioritizing or weighing the evaluation criteria was needed to identify which criteria were more important or valuable to regional stakeholders and the community. 
The assigned weight of each criterion place a level of importance on each relative to the other and assist in selecting projects that help to achieve the region's transportation systems goals and investment priorities. They then use these criteria and weights to select which projects make it to the fiscally constrained project list in the MTP. And notice here that this approach resulted in the selection of a project to improve traffic signals across the city. There could legitimately be some concern that weighting project selection toward congestion reduction could result in the selection of more roadway widening projects, increasing single occupant vehicle capacity on the system. But a well balanced approach to project scoring would also have a negative impact on scoring for road widening projects. The potential for environmental and community impacts, along with high implementation costs, often reduces the potential that a roadway widening project would be selected for the MTP cost feasible project list. Another route some MPOs take is to set aside funds for a specific category of project, funding source, or both. But the individual projects or services are selected as part of a separate process described in the MTP. This is sometimes called set aside funding or box funding. For example, an MPO may set aside $2 million a year for the life of the MTP for TISMA projects that are selected as part of a call for projects, like a local grant funding mechanism. And applications for the funds could be considered by staff or even by a committee established for that purpose using an open and public selection process that is forwarded to the MPO board for final approval. Another MPO might set aside, say, $10 million every five years over the life of the MTP for projects identified and prioritized within the CMP. A board approved document we discussed at length in a previous module. These approaches allow MPOs to direct funding for a specific purpose while maintaining flexibility on the selection of individual projects and services in the future and provides the MPO board with final approval authority. You mentioned the CMP or the congestion management process a few times now. As you said, we covered the CMP in depth in another module, but in this wrap up, I would really like to know how it connects with everything else. Well, in a nutshell, the information from other MPO plans and studies, including the CMP, is used as input for making final decisions, and those final decisions are housed in the MTP. In fact, the MPO should be considering very early in the MTP development process exactly what kind of information it will need to make the best decisions possible. Do they need a plan or study to generate that kind of information or is the information already available from another source? These plans and studies are often described in the MTP document itself. And there are a wide range of studies and data collection activities that the MPO might take on related to congestion reduction. For instance, we know that CMP identifies congested corridors and bottlenecks and usually includes a list of activities that the MPO would like to consider for funding in the MTP. But it's pretty common that more information is needed than whatever is stated in the CMP to be able to move forward on some of these activities. When this happens, the MPO will conduct more detailed studies. These studies help the MPO get a deeper understanding of the root causes of congestion in a corridor or area and develop strategies for addressing a specific issue. So most of the time, these strategies will be in the CMP, but in general, overarching terms. The study, on the other hand, will detail the application of those strategies to the specific issue being covered. Then the resulting strategy, which may include a project or specific action, could be considered for funding as part of the MTP. Other types of studies or plans that relate to congestion include TISMO plans, EDM plans, ITS plans, plans and studies related to modal alternatives like bicycle and transit development, and the list goes on. Basically, an MPO can initiate a study or data collection process whenever it believes it needs more info in order to make good decisions. And this is one of the places where the role of board member as a teammate comes into play. Your MPO staff is gonna be key in identifying when these actions are needed and in executing many of these plans and studies. Right, and as you can imagine, the main stumbling block is whether there are enough resources to complete them. Studies and plans are funded in the MPO's Unified Planning Work Program, or UPWP. 
So when an MPO board is asked to approve the UPWP every year or two, they should expect to see planning activities that fund all types of studies and data collection activities, which will feed information into the MTP development process. If the board is interested in making congestion reduction an important element of the MTP, they should expect to see tasks in the UPWP that will provide the MPO with important information related to congestion reduction. The tricky part for both MPO staff and for board members is matching up available funding in the UPWP with all the activities and studies that would be useful. It's a balancing act and individual board members need to ask themselves and their staff what's worth funding. All right. Now I have a clear picture of how the MTP, CMP, and the UPWP are connected and why they are important documents for someone on the MPO board. But I need your help with the tip. You just mentioned that the MPO spends money through the UPWP to fund studies, data collection processes, and other internal activities. So what exactly is the role of the TIP and how is it connected to the rest of the MPO's planning process? Okay, the UPWP is the document used by MPOs to schedule and fund activities internal to the MPO. So all the studies and plans we just talked about. It's how the MPO pays its staff, consultants, they pay rent from there, any other internal agency operations. Federal funds provided to MPOs for this specific purpose, those are the so-called federal planning dollars that we discussed in a previous module, sometimes referred to as PL dollars, along with any state or local dollars contributed to the MPO for planning purposes, those are what's shown in the UPWP. The TIP, or TIP, is also about assigning funds and programming projects and services, but that's external to the MPO. You can think of it as an implementation tool for the MTP. The MTP houses the process for determining whether projects meet the goals and objectives of the MPO and identifies needs and opportunities for the region. As funding becomes available, projects and activities consistent with the objectives of the MTP can then be programmed in the TIP. These external projects and services include environmental documentation, project design, right-of-way acquisition, construction, and more. It's cost affordable, like the MTP, but it covers a much shorter time period than the MTP. So you really need to be certain that the funds will be, in fact, available for the projects and services programmed. And just like the MTP, any project looking to receive federal transportation funding must appear in the TIP. And how does a project or service end up in the TIP or TIP? It's pretty similar to how they get into the MTP. In fact, for a project to make it into the TIP, it must first appear either directly or at least by reference in the MTP. Once it's clear that sufficient funds will be available for those projects or services, the MPO draws those projects out of the MTP and includes them in the TIP for funding. Each MPO develops their own methodology for programming projects in the TIP. Programming is completed in concert with the state DOT and other funding partners and their own programming processes. Right. The methodology for prioritizing projects for inclusion in the TIP may include a weighted formula, a call for projects, committee run selection process, or a selection process that derives from a different plan like the CMP. Projects appearing in the MTP as an individual project will likely be selected based on a weighted formula or by some other policy criteria. If an MPO wants to emphasize that funds in the TIP are being used to reduce congestion, putting more weight on those types of projects, including and even emphasizing those projects and services that do not increase single occupant vehicle capacity. For projects that will be using funds set aside in the MTP for a specific purpose, including set-asides for congestion reduction, will typically use those other approaches, committee-driven processes and so on, for selecting specific projects to include in a TIP. You know, while we're talking about funding for the TIP, I think it's a good time to mention the three Cs because they're a requirement if MPOs plan on getting those federal dollars. Oh, right. 
We talked about the 3C planning process in a previous module, but yeah, I'd like to know how 3Cs connect with everything else we have talked about so far. We've actually been talking about it this whole module. The development of the MTP, TIP, and all those other studies, plans, and activities are part of the process, but for clarity's sake, I think it deserves special attention for a few minutes. I agree. I think this is an important but often overlooked way for MPOs to impact congestion on the transportation system. This is about influence and education and coordination by the MPO as an organization. The MPO has an obligation under federal law to provide a forum for discussing transportation issues in the metropolitan area. That includes discussing congestion reducing practices and actions and solutions that could be taken by other agencies. For example, the decision to expand capacity at the local airport is a decision made by the agency responsible for the airport, not the MPO. But the MPO can invite airport leadership to come discuss the impact that expansion would have on the surface transportation network and what actions could be taken to mitigate and accommodate the expected impact. Perhaps the MPO could also invite the transit agency into the conversation to discuss the, the potential for increased service between the airport and the central business district and other primary job hubs. And maybe the airport could find ways to accommodate the increased transit service on and through airport property and maybe even provide an opportunity for the transit agency to market that service. But that conversation might not happen if the MPO wasn't providing the space for it to happen. But how would MPO board members know to have these discussions? After all, they were appointed to the MPO board, not as transportation experts, but by virtue of the elected or appointed office they hold or because of their job or their leadership position in the community. Well, they could listen to this particular video. We're telling them, but you're right. MPO board members come to their MPO role with little or no formal training or experience in transportation. It's the job of the MPO staff to educate MPO board members on transportation issues, including the nature of congestion. The staff can provide educational experiences for MPO board members. These include inviting guest speakers from partner agencies and local universities to present at MPO board meetings, providing board members with background materials for them to read, they could hold lunch and learn events for board members. They could produce online training programs for board members to access on their own time, or they could hold offsite field trips or retreats for MPO board members to learn about transportation issues firsthand. MPO board members can also attend state or national conferences, conferences like those held by the Association of MPOs and the National Association of Regional Councils, AMPO and NARC where they can participate in sessions that focus on a wide variety of transportation subjects. Right, and attending these conferences is an activity that you can plan for and program into your UPWP, meaning federal planning dollars can be used to pay for board members and MPO staff to attend these conferences. Yeah, but you need to make sure that complies with state law. Also, AMPO and NARC staff are happy to come talk to your MPO, so if that's something you want, you just need to reach out and talk to them. But ultimately, it's up to MPO board members to avail themselves of these opportunities so they can more fully and knowledgeably engage in the discussions that are being held during MPO board meetings. This will also help them make more informed planning and programming decisions. Right, and it's actually not only the job of the MPO to ensure that board members are educated, the MPO should offer educational opportunities for stakeholders and the public so that they can engage in the MPO decision-making process too. Each MPO tackles this in a different way, but a common thread among MPOs is the federally required Public Participation Plan, or PPP. This plan, which we discussed in a previous module, is crucial because effective community engagement takes some combination of time, money, and effort, all of which are finite. In order to get the most participation bang for your buck, an MPO has to thoughtfully craft the methods and mode you're going to use to make sure it's getting useful and digestible information out to the public and then getting input back in an efficient and coherent way. The PPP houses the policies and principles that guide the MPO's communications and coordination with the public and stakeholders. By the way, I wanna clarify that when we say the public, 
and I put that in quotes, the public. We mean the general public in addition to other types of groups that need to be engaged in this process, including certain affected public agencies, public transportation employees, freight shippers, people who represent users of public transport or walkways or bicycle facilities and representatives from the disability community. And that's just to name a few. And the more involved MPO board members are in this process, the better. After all, the MPO board is responsible for making final decisions on MPO plans and programs. The more they are seen as knowledgeable, the more confident the public and stakeholders can be that the decisions board members are making are the best ones for the community. In fact, if one or more of the board members can learn enough about an issue, including the issue of congestion reduction, and the more they can get out in the community to champion that cause, the more likely that the MPO and its partners will stay focused on that issue and make relevant improvements on the transportation network. All right. So say I am a single MPO board member concerned about congestion in my region. How do I go about making positive changes in my metropolitan area? Well, it typically takes strong political skills and willpower. I'll be honest, it isn't always easy. Getting things accomplished that are outside of the current norm at a typical MPO, like any other organization, requires both persistence and patience. That's a distinctive kind of leadership. And leaders with persistence and patience can accomplish remarkable things. A board member looking to inject fresh ideas and a new approach must understand that the legal authority of an MPO is relatively narrow. But that authority granted under law does not define the limits of political influence, either theirs or the MPOs. It should be clear by now that MPOs do not have direct control over the transportation system in their metropolitan area. And while MPOs legally are involved in planning and programming a wide array of funds, this is almost always through collaborative processes with other agencies. That, however, is not to say that the MPO as a body or MPO board members as individuals lack the ability to influence the process. In addition to simply good politics, two aspects of the MPO role are critical to understanding this influence. First, remember that MPOs are responsible for creating a public forum for the discussion of transportation issues in their metropolitan area, not only as a board member within their rights, but are in fact fulfilling their obligations when the MPO brings transportation issues forward, invites parties to the table, and works to solve transportation problems. Whether or not the MPO can decide what to do, the MPO can influence the decisions being made in their area. And second, a project or activity must appear in the MPO, MTP, and TIP to be eligible for federal transportation dollars. I can't stress that enough. It is the responsibility of the MPO board to make sure that projects that make it into the MTP and TIP align with the MPO's vision and goals. Projects that do not align with their vision and goals should be analyzed and discussed. And the MPO can consider not including a project, but that is a drastic step. What really needs to happen is that everyone work together. Everybody interested in federal funding for transportation needs the MPO to work with them, even as the MPO needs to work with its partners. So what you're saying is that it's in everybody's best interest to find common cause as it relates to improving the transportation network, including as it relates to approaches to reduce congestion. Exactly. Transportation planning is a highly interdependent process, except at the margins. Very little important transportation work can be done without collaboration. Even small local projects may have big regional implications. It's important for MPO board members to provide leadership by modeling this awareness of interdependence. There really isn't much room for the solitary political actor when it comes to the MPO process. And that means that finding common cause between members of the board and between agencies matters. And that reasons for implementing a project or service matters, even if the parties involved don't share the same reasons. Effective MPO board members use the MPO process to forge alliances to advance congestion reduction related activities, 
to advance safety, economic competitiveness, environmental preservation, or system preservation? Well, that was some terrific stuff. I think MPO board members should get a lot out of this conversation. I know for me, it kind of put all of the information together from our previous modules and summed up what an MPO and an MPO board member can do to work on congestion reduction in their own metropolitan area. That's the idea. In an effort to help reinforce some of the main points from this module, here are a few questions board members can ask themselves. Does your MPO MTP include reducing congestion as a goal? What strategies are identified in your MPO documents to reduce congestion? Are they multimodal in nature? Do your project selection methodologies consider congestion reduction? What do you think is the best way to address congestion in your metropolitan area? Have you discussed this with other members of the MPO board with the public? Who is the congestion reduction champion at your MPO? As we have suggested at the end of each of these modules, go ahead and discuss congestion reduction with your MPO staff and don't hesitate to reach out to AMPO or NARC with questions or feedback. Well, there you have it. We've covered a lot of ground and we hope that you have a much better understanding of how the MPO and you can play a role to reduce congestion in your community. If you feel like you need to go back and refresh yourself on one of the previous modules, maybe listen to the audio on your way to work while you're sitting in traffic. They will be available whenever you need them. Thank you.